welcome to the last session of the day, uh, or at least one of the last two sessions of the day. So thank you everyone for, for coming. I think we have a full house. This is great. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Jared Knolte. I'm a floating technology lead at Total Energies, um, which is a offshore wind developer. My background is in naval architecture and mooring, and so I'm very excited about the session today. I think we have uh, a lot of good talks uh, and a lot of good innovations that we're going to come up and see. Uh, you might ask yourself, or you might already be familiar, why we need innovations in the moorings. Um, primary reason is the moorings that we've been using have been designed for oil and gas. They work great for oil and gas. They've been optimized for oil and gas but we need something that's more optimized for offshore wind to help further along the innovation and to get the costs down. And because we have five speakers today, I'm gonna mainly let them <laughs> speak today and I'll let them introduce themselves. So we're gonna start today with Bradley Ling uh, from Principal Power. Thank you, I'm Bradley Ling. I'm on the technology team at Principal Power. Um, generally, I have more of a focus on global performance, but serving as the PI for the shallow flow project. Um, for, so for this project, uh, we're really looking at innovative mooring solutions for shallow water sites for floating offshore wind. And we're defining shallow water as 40 to 60 meters here. Um, you know, um, catenary mooring systems become more and more challenging the more shallow you get. Um, if you think you have a nonlinear stiffness restoring curve for a mooring system, and as you get into shallower water, the steepness of that curve gets stiffer sooner. Um, and so that leads to both problems with strength, where um, your loads can start to rapidly increase um, as, your, as your offset increases, but it can also cause fatigue problems. And we've been seeing uh, principal power um, in project experience, both in shallow water sites, but also in deep water sites, um, that as these turbines get larger and larger, fatigue is becoming more of a driving concern for the mooring systems. Um, if you think about it, not only do we have the wave-induced motions coming from the platform, but we also have this large turbine with oscillating thrust loads that the mooring system has to offset. So when you combine both of those with a shallow water system, um, fatigue becomes more and more of a concern. And the turbine loads, we can't really do anything about. Um, we're hosting a turbine. That's, that, that's our job as a platform designer. And so it's something that the mooring system has to deal with. And so for this specific project, uh, we're looking at a specific component to see if we can integrate that into our mooring system toolbox for um, potential designs um, and see how much benefit it has in shallow water sites. And so just a quick overview of the project team. Um, the one key member here, uh, TFI Marine, they're the developers of this mooring component. So it's a polymer mooring um, spring, and I'll go through it in a little bit more detail. Uh, they're based in Ireland, but have a couple of offices um, elsewhere. We're also working with Ocker Solutions on some testing facility um, access for this component. Um, we're also working with Enrol. I'm working with uh, Matt, actually, who will be talking later, and his colleague, Erica, um, doing some open source work, so integrating um, the ability to model these components in OpenFast and also do an open source design um, to illustrate some of the benefits on the IEA 15 um, in the Humane Semi-Submersible platform. We're also working with ABS, um, pursuing an AIP, an AIP for this system, for, for a mooring system that includes this sea spring design uh, from TFI. And then obviously, um, NOWRDC is funding this work. So just a, a quick highlight on project details. Uh, this is a three-year project. It started uh, last summer, so we're about halfway through. And it's broken up into a handful of different work packages that I'll go through later. I won't spend too much time on it right now, um, but we have completed like site selection design basis work and done a lot of the upfront work with TFI to prepare for a lot of the desktop design work um, that's been ongoing this year. And then next year is going to be focused more on component level testing and commercial assessments of these different designs. So the site that we're looking at um, is the New York Bight area. Um, this is a good representative site of East Coast waters. Um, it has a high annual average water, or sorry, it has a high average annual wind speed, um, and it also is right in that sweet spot of, of shallow water systems that we want to look at. So uh, the site we're considering is 50 meters of water depth. And so we went in and got uh, med ocean data for this specific site. Um, it's, it's not actually in a lease area, but it's next to a lot of the lease areas in the New York Bight area to be kind of representative of the med ocean conditions that exist um, in these lease areas. 
And so to talk about the technology, I guess this is a PDF. This was an animation. Um, but the, the, TF, the technology has been developed by TFI Marine. They've been working on this for 10 years or so. Um, they've done some small scale testings. Um, they've done some field um, deployments with this for aqu aquaculture. Um, and they're looking to you know, create a, a solution that works for the floating offshore wind space. And so, so their design is a polymer spring. Um, and it works in compression. So you have two pieces of metalwork here on this side and this side, and um, they, they, they're, they're separate and they're interlocking and they slide. And so as tension increases on your mooring system, it pulls these polymer components into compression. And so that's where the, the, the restoring is coming from. And so it's absorbing energy um, in the polymer spring, so it's acting as, 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 a, as an energy absorption um, that's part of your mooring system. And so what I have here is an example elongation and then tension curve for this C spring. And so that there's a couple of different inflection points that we can see in this curve. So, so early on, it's designed to, um, you know, it's a little bit steeper. It's coming up into pretension. And as it comes um, into the 20, 30, 40% elongation, that curve flattens. Um, and so what that's allowing us to do is change the response curve of the overall mooring system. So instead of having the, as it gets, um, as, as your offset increases, instead of having increasing tensions, um, it allows it to flatten that out. And so the energy is being absorbed without as many oscillations in um, tension of your overall mooring system. And then you get to this kink at 50% here, uh, and you can see the curve suddenly stiffens. And that's actually, if you can imagine these bellows compressing, the top halves of these bellows that are sticking out actually come into contact with each other. So all of a sudden, you have significantly more surface area of the polymer touching each other. And so you get a, a sharp increase in that response. Um, and then this, that region there is a region that you generally try to avoid operating in, but is safe for the component to operate in that. And then um, when you get to a little bit higher, um, there's actually a lockout of the polymer with the metalwork. So then the metalwork comes into contact with each other and can't compress anymore. One of the interesting things with this design is, is that you, you they they can decouple the design of the polymer component with the design of the metalwork. So their approach is to design the MBL of the metalwork to be higher than the MBL of the um, polymer component. And so, um, and because it's operating in compression and it has a lockout, that polymer can't compress beyond that lockout point. Um, so that helps ensure that the polymer um, is, stays in its safe operating range. There's a couple of different design variables available for this component. Um, there's different load ratings, and then you can add more springs to your mooring line. So, so um, for the different load ratings, that essentially they change the diameter of these polymers um, here. And so you can shift this curve upwards or downwards depending on how you want to use it. And you could use, say, two per mooring line or four per mooring line or three per mooring line. Um, there's a bit of a design optimization process that goes into designing a mooring system with this component. And so the, the first step, once we kind of learned more about this component and, and from TFI, um, the first step is working with NREL is to just develop the ability to model this in um, OpenFast. Um, OrcaFlex, which is, is what Principal Power typically uses for our global performance and mooring analysis, had the capability, so we wanted to pull that into OpenFast to make it available to, to the community. And so um, the modeling approach for early stage design for this is essentially to just have an interpolated um, tension and offset value for that. And so um, that, was, that was implemented um, into Mordine, and I have some validation results here just comparing a couple of test cases with one of those TFI components in a mooring system, comparing Mordine results, which is the, the mooring solver part of OpenFast, to um, OrcaFlex results, including that spring. And as you can see, um, Mordine is modeling the behavior the same way as OrcaFlex is modeling the behavior. Um, the second half of the work that NREL did is there is an open source mooring design. So taking the IEA 15 megawatt turbine and the UMaine semi-submersible um, platform designed for that IEA 15 megawatt turbine and putting it at the site that we're considering. Um, they designed a mooring system um, with baseline. So that's essentially an all-chain catenary system, uh, three-line system. I have a, a, a sketch here, just the overall layout. And then they added... TFI C springs to that mooring design to see how the design could be changed. Because, you know, you could take a TFI C spring and put it in your mooring system and reduce your loads, 
But if you don't change anything else in your mooring system, you're just increasing the cost of your mooring system. You know, you want to use that different performance to figure out where you can remove cost from the rest of the mooring system. And so actually, um, Erica is going to be presenting a lot more details on this work at IOWTC if you're sticking around for the rest of the week. So I won't go too much in, into her results. Um, but the, the, the kind of highlight here is, is that because the design was driven by fatigue, uh, we actually found a case where we she used two different spring ratings in series. So there was one spring rating that's a little bit lower um, that actually locks out in the ultimate load case scenarios. Um, but that gives more compliance in that lower range of tensions um, where a lot of the fatigue damage was coming. And then a higher um, load rating spring um, to help mitigate those extreme loads. And with that final design that she arrived at, um, the chain diameter uh, went from 200 millimeters to 165 millimeters, and the line length was able to be reduced quite a bit as well because um, we weren't picking up as much mooring line from the catenary system. And then some initial highlights on what the principal power design. So we are also performing a design on a wind float. Um, we're also using the IA15 megawatt turbine, um, so the same turbine that NREL is using. Um, this work, just the way that the project um, schedule fell out, um, is we started this work um, a lot later than NREL started their design work, so we're still kind of in the early screening phases and things like that. Um, but ge the general mooring design approach we're taking is we're looking at all the different DLCs that um, we've learned from experience can drive mooring system design, um, identify what cases are driving for both the baseline design and a design including the C-spring, and then iterating on simplified analysis or like a reduced set of load cases. Because as I said, the design space has grown more than a normal mooring system. If you think of a plain chain mooring system, you really only have two design variables. You have pretension and you have chain diameter. But then if you start adding more components and then you start adding components with multiple variables, um, there's a lot more design iterations to look at. And so again, what we've seen, um, as I mentioned at the beginning and similar to NREL, is the design has really been driven a lot by fatigue damage. So it was relatively straightforward to design a system that could handle the strength cases, um, but fatigue damage was really driving up chain diameter um, for both mooring systems with and without the TFI C-spring. So we're still kind of iterating and learning what the best configuration with the C-spring is going to look like for that uh, with different parametric studies before running those final sims. But our early results are showing um, a 75% increase in fatigue life. So, so life increasing is a, is a positive direction. Um, in the most damaging line by including a C-spring and also an accompanying 23% reduction in ultimate loading with that early design. But again, we're still going through back and forth, trying a couple more different design iterations with that and having some discussions with uh, TFI to make sure that we're not missing anything in the design process that they've seen and some of the other studies they've done with other platforms. And then so next steps for the project, um, like I said, 2022 has really been focused on desktop design work. Uh, 2023, um, as we wrap up the desktop design work, we're going to be um, component testing uh, one of these TFI components. And so it's, it's a full scale component, but not what you would use on a 15 megawatt platform. It would, it's a full scale component for like if you were designing a platform for say a two to five megawatt platform, um, that's the component that we'll be testing. And so we've begun initial conversations with TFI and Ocker Solutions about um, planning for that test. There's a, a variety of different tests that um, we're looking at to look at um, things like creep and to v validate that um, the curve, the, the response curve from that. And um, TFI has also started manufacturing those components. Um, they're, they're actually using those components for a couple of different um, things coming up. So, that, so they've already begun manufacturing both the metalwork and the polymer components for that. Um, and they'll also be doing some initial review of the manufacturing with DNV as part of a separate effort, not the shallow flow project. Um, and then, as I said, we'll also be completing the PPI mooring design. And then as testing completes, we'll be looking at doing a LCOE assessment for both the open source design working with NREL, as well as an LCOE assessment on the proprietary mooring design. So not just how much cost can we get out of the mooring system, but how does that result in overall LCOE of the, of the system for these shallow water systems? And then um, the other bullet point not written here, um, but we'll be working with ABS to pursue that AIP of the mooring system design that includes this TFI C-spring. And that's what I have. I look forward to your questions at the end of the session.
so maybe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay, got it. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, Ain't moving. <coughs> oh, up and down. Okay. All right. Um, so, this project, uh, now RDC one five four six two nine, was um, uh, a project which completed um, early this year, and so we were told that this was the first project to be completed. So all the close-out procedures, and um, um, we were our project was actually used as a test bed for doing all those close-out procedures. So all those other projects which are in various stages of completion, you can come back and thank me later. <laughs> um, so although this project got completed, uh, we are still here because we had uh, such a great support from uh, the Navar DC team, and um, so it's. Um, it's it's nice to be back here uh, talking to all the folks here. Um, so University of Massachusetts Amherst is a prime applicant of this project. Um, um, we had a, a fine working team uh, made up of Technip Energies, um, uh, main marine composites, all of whom are uh, represented here, and uh, ABS, American Bureau of Shipping. Um, we also had Equinor as an independent sponsor. All right, um, so this, this project arose out of um, uh, a need to look at um, uh, shallow water mooring systems for um, floating offshore wind turbines. And um, some of the challenges with shallow water are very well known, uh, including catenary systems having a very long uh, 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 lay on the, on the ground, which requires um, a very large mooring footprint. And, um, there's also the challenge of uh, incorporating um, synthetic lines into, into, into mooring systems, which also increases uh, complexity and challenges. So in this project, we were uh, very interested in uh, looking at a uh, few configurations of shallow water mooring systems and uh, look at um, uh, the relative merits of them and also do a, a simulations and cost comparison. So our approach followed a standard pre-feed work, uh, literature review followed by a design basis and premise, uh, floater turbine and mooring sizing, uh, and um, then conducting numerical simulations, and finally a cost modeling. So in this, um, in this project to start with, we were focused on a 10 megawatt reference turbine. Um, and you can see some of the details. Uh, this is a standard um, open source turbine which we used for our, uh, for our study. The 15 megawatt was still in the process of being made, so the 10 megawatt was what we ended up using. Um, so we, we chose, after looking at some of the available data, we chose uh, two sites, um, one in the Gulf of Maine and another one in Nantucket. Uh, we had uh, data from a uh, couple of buoys, one from, from the Humane uh, buoy and another one, a NOAA buoy, in these two locations. Uh, we chose these locations because of the, the water depth, which is uh, ranging from 60 to 100 meters in, this, uh, in these two sites. And we had sufficient amount of wave and wind, um, wind uh, data. And from these, from, uh, from the data collected as well as uh, from some hindcast work, um, we were able to obtain uh, the design environmental conditions for uh, various um, design load cases, DLCs, um, the operating condition, the parked or the idle condition, and uh, the survival condition, SLC. Um, so you can see in the table, you can see the wind speeds, the significant wave height, uh, the peak wave period, and also the current speeds. And we had this for both the Monhegan site and the Nantucket site. So the semi-submersible platform design came out of um, the OC4 standard semi-submersible design. 
And uh, so this was uh, scaled upwards. The OC4 semi was a five megawatt system. This was scaled upward. Um, Technip, who was involved in the original OC4 design, uh, worked with us on uh, developing, scaling up this, um, um, this uh, platform. So you can see uh, three corner columns with the, with the very large base at the, uh, at the bottom of the columns and the entire structure is held together by truss elements and uh, the, the wind turbine sits in the, in the central column, which is uh, the column for the tower. <clears throat> so the mooring configuration for this, we, we, we worked with a number of mooring configurations. So if I go back here, um, we started with uh, our base case was a um, standard catenary chain um, and then uh, we also looked at synthetic elements, both uh, polyester and nylon. And uh, we also looked at three, three lines per column and then reducing that to two and one because we were also interested in looking at redundancy in the, in the system um, and uh, the cost implications of that. So I'll show you one uh, mooring configuration, which is the one we did the most work on, which is a platform uh, chain and a heavy chain combination uh, in the upper end, uh, followed by a polyester line and then an anchor chain at the bottom end. So this is very similar to the chain wire chain or a chain rope chain arrangement, except you have an extra heavy chain at the top end to create a slight um, catenary or a more compliant shape on the, on the, on the line. Um, so you can also see the diameter of these uh, segments, the mean breaking uh, load on the lines, the wet weight, and the, and the length of the lines which we used. And this is um, given for uh, the 60 meters. We, we also scale this upwards for the 100. All right, so that's the, the basic configuration. And the simulations were done uh, in, mainly in OrcaFlex. Um, and the prep work was done in, uh, in various CAD, CAD uh, programs and uh, uh, hydrodynamic uh, diffraction code called WAMIT was used for obtaining the coefficient database which we need. Uh, the wind turbine was modeled with the FAST controller implemented in it. Uh, ORCAFLEX, as many of you know, is a time domain, multi-body hydrodynamics. Uh, it's a mid-fidelity type simulator. Um, in the interest of time, I go directly into the results. Um, we do have, uh, we did do a lot of calibration work. We did a number of benchmarking uh, simulations. Quite a few runs were conducted altogether. About 60 to 80 runs were conducted. Um, but I just show you the key results here um, in the interest of time. So this is DLC 1.6, which is operating wind speed condition, 50-year return storms. Um, you can see on the left is the surge offset, the middle is a pitch offset, and the maximum line tension on the right-hand side. Um, and each of the bar chart um, has two lines. One is for an SL yaw of zero, and the other one is when the wind changes direction and the, and the turbine has to be uh, rotated 180 degrees. So it's, it's facing um, uh, the opposite direction to how the waves are coming. Um, so that's, that's the Nussel Yaw of 180. And you can also see under each of those pa uh, pairs of lines, there is either a three lines, 60 meters. So there are a terminology which says the number of lines and the water depth as well. Um, so we didn't see many surprises in the surge and the pitch offsets. Um, and in the line tension, we, we as one would expect, uh, the one line condition, uh, that is one line per corner, one line per column, one line condition has the highest amount of tension with uh, both the 60 and the 100 meters about kind of very similar in terms of numbers. So this is the result for the 6.1, which is the parked condition with the turbine at fault. 
um, and the storms are still at the 50-year return. And again, this is comparatively uh, mild um, uh, in relation to the previous one in terms of surge offset and the pitch offset. Numbers are very kind of reasonable. Um, the tensions are, in one case, at least in the one line 60 meters, the tension are a bit higher at about 6,000 uh, kilonewtons. Um, so compared to the previous case, it does actually go up in terms of line tension when the, when the turbine is parked. Um, we then followed it through for the survival load case, which is uh, the 500 year return period. And the turbine is of course not operating in this case. And uh, here we saw the highest amount of uh, tension in the lines at um, uh, a little over 6,000 uh, kilonewtons. So, but actually close to 7,000. Uh, in both the 60 meters water depth and the 100 meters water depth case. And again, um, we didn't see many surprises in the surge offset and in the pitch offset cases. Um, so these are the strength, strength um, uh, related simulations where uh, summer, in, uh, in summary, looking at the factors of safety, uh, in most cases, we have very reasonable, very good factors of safety. Uh, and the worst condition is, of course, when, uh, um, when, you looked at, uh, when we looked at uh, the one-line case, uh, the factors of safety for the mooring systems are actually hovering around two, little over two. In fact, here you can see there is a case of where the mooring uh, factors of safety are around 2.3, 2.4. That's the, the most, most onerous case. So that's on the, on the basis of strength. And then we wanted to look at um, fatigue uh, because of the scope of the project and uh, the fact that it was only a feasibility study. Uh, the, the fatigue analysis was, was uh, very simplified. We didn't, we didn't use a scatter diagram uh, in, in our um, uh, analysis. We basically assumed an exposure duration and uh, gave, a, gave kind of an offset for uh, uh, downtime due to weather and maintenance. And uh, we also included the survival condition in there. Um, and we looked at the number of hours uh, and the rate of percentage and then worked, worked the fatigue from that, from that end using built-in Orcaflex uh, fatigue analysis methods. Uh, so the, the fatigue actually showed something interesting in that um, if you look at the picture on the left, which is 100 meters water depth, the picture on the right is 60 meters water depth. Um, the, the line colors, the blue line on the left is two lines per pontoon. The red is actually one line per pontoon. And um, uh, what we see uh, is in the left side, if the damage limit is, uh, is at 10% of the total, then we actually see that the uh, one line configuration fails um, in, in our analysis. And the failure actually is, is in the chain components rather than the synthetic line components. So that was very interesting. The same sort of similar sort of results are also observed in the case of um, uh, the the 60 meters water depth, where um, you can see the, the one line case, which is the, the brown, orangish line. Again, you see the chains um, failing when you, uh, when you look at the extreme damage limit. The two line case, also we see some of the chain failure occurring. So, um, beyond this, we also looked at, uh, based on um, available data, we also did a cost comparison of these various systems, and they are all uh, summarized in our reports, which should be available through the, through the websites, NYSERDA website. Um, <clears throat> so from, from, from our study, we, we concluded that um, the shallow water mooring systems with synthetic lines are feasible. Uh, and uh, with the one line case is is doable that is there are concerns about the fatigue of these systems and the concern is more on the chains rather than on the on the synthetic lines 
So the entire line has to be evaluated in a, in a much more serious way to look at uh, fatigue-related fatigue, fatigue related damages. The minimum factor of safety, on the other hand, from a strength standpoint, is, is still um, acceptable from uh, any of the class, class standards, class requirements. Um, so this was intended to just be a feasibility study over a short 18-month time frame. So I think we, we accomplished quite a bit from, uh, and learned a lot, and uh, we are on the lookout for other opportunities where we can uh, develop the fatigue analysis uh, even further. I think I will leave it there. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. My name's <clears throat> excuse me, Spencer Hollowell. I'm from the University of Maine, and I'm going to be talking to you today, kind of an extension on, on Chris's work, and that's using taut synthetic moorings for 15 megawatt floating wind turbine in shallow waters. Um, thank you to Now RDC. Thank you to our, our program manager, Julian. Um, and also thank you to the uh, research advisory board who's played a significant role in giving us really positive feedback and really guiding this research to be meaningful from a commercial development standpoint, which in the end, that's why we're all here, right? Um, so I, I, again, I'm from the University of Maine. We're a, a, a small R1 research university in, located in Orono, Maine. Um, the arrow here indicates the lab that I work for, which is the Advanced Structures and Composite Center. Um, this particular lab was funded by the NSF in 1996. Um, we have over 2,300 students have been funded and have worked within the lab. Um, we now are at 300 plus faculty, staff, and students. I've been there two years, and we've pretty much doubled in size in the past two years. Um, we have over 100,000 square foot lab space, 10 spin off companies, numerous patents, and all of the other accolades that you can see here. Um, one particular toy that I like to show off here is our wind wave basin, where we can conduct scale model tests of floating offshore wind turbine technology. And that's the primary use of, of this basin, is we want to accelerate the growth of, of prototype scales all the way up to commercially deployable um, machines. So we have a, a wave machine that can, um, has independent paddles, so we can make directionally uh, directed waves up to 8.8 meters in wave height. We have a wind machine that can control the turbulence of wind using um, different fans up to 12 meters per second. And the position of the basin floor can be uh, located up and down. It's, it's a movable floor bottom so that we can change the water depth for different tests that we need to. So specifically with this project, the goal is to develop a 25% front end engineering design of a synthetic rope mooring line system for a 15 megawatt Volturnus US platform in water depths between 45 and 80 meters. As you'll see in later slides, we generated a, a design for 56 meters of water depth using nylon ropes off the coast of New York in the New York Bight location. We then validated the design through model test in our wind wave basin, where we used active mooring control to generate the nonlinear mooring component loads that are necessary to actually capture the behavior of these synthetic ropes. And then an ongoing task that we're working on right now, we actually just had ropes delivered to our testing facility. Um, those ropes are going to be full-scale rope tests as well as sub-rope tests to classify what the ultimate limit state performance of the ropes are, as well as the fatigue performance of the ropes, because nylon ropes have a question about what their fatigue performance is as a permanent mooring system. When all of that is done, we're going to certify the project through an ABS approval and principle process, and that process has been used for many years to qualify technology to ensure that it's ready and readily and commercially available. On the right here, you can see a, a schematic of the 15 megawatt uh, floating offshore wind platform as well as a synthetic uh, taut system here. You can see the lines are pretty much straight between the floating offshore wind turbine and the anchor points. We do use a little bit of chain at the fair lead connection as well as the anchor connection. That's to facilitate installation. Ultimate goals, I think, are, are going to be to eliminate as much chain out of the system as possible, especially when we start looking at, at deep water locations like in California. As part of this project, we've also looked at using different anchor technologies. Because we're now moved to a taut uh, system, we have to resist uplift loads at the anchor location. And so that requires special consideration of anchor technologies. We've looked at using Triton uh, helical anchors as well as different um, VLAs and drag embedment anchors to withstand those loads. And then ultimately here, you can see a, a very small schematic of what a synthetic rope looks like. The idea here is it's just like any other rope that you're used to, but it's a lot bigger. So we've looked at up to 220 millimeter diameter ropes. Those are made up of uh, smaller sub ropes, and those sub ropes are made up of different synthetic fibers. 
So the mo motivation behind this project is that more than 50% of the offshore wind resource in the US is gonna be in 60 meters of water depth or more. Synthetic ropes provide a cost saving alternative to an all steel system because catenary systems start becoming very heavy. Um, it requires a lot of steel and handling all of that material becomes particularly difficult when you wanna pile all of those components onto one system. Synthetic ropes can be stored on a reel and they can pay, be paid out from a reel when you're actually installing those systems. Also synthetic material um, ropes in conjunction with clump weights, uh, different buoyancy and anchor configurations can, can provide a customization for project specific needs. So what we can do is take what we've learned from this shallow water application off the coast of New York and potentially apply some of those principles to a deep water location off of California. And all we have to do is change some of the subcomponents, maybe use a different type of rope material, um, maybe use a, a clump weight instead of a, a buoyancy module. You can change those little things um, in order to, to get the performance that you need. And um, a, a statistic that I like to show here is that there's a study done by the Catapult um, Report, who's a, a, a research um, outfit. Uh, this was done in uh, 2021 that says, by 2030, the global um, supply chain is going to need tens of kilometers of synthetic rope um, by 2030. And, and Jarek and I were, were talking earlier, we think that's a, a low ball number. Um, and hundreds of kilometers of rope by 2040. So um, the supply chain um, will need to catch up to this and synthetics, I think, can play a particular role in developing that large magnitude of mooring um, that is going to need to be available for floating offshore wind as it develops. So some of the um, specific advantage of synthetic ropes for polyester rope um, has a long-term performance in oil and gas. So it, it has a decades long performance as a permanent mooring system. Um, and nylon ropes have been used as, as housers and, and tow lines. So they do have a performance in, in showing um, kind of flexible performance and ultimate limit um, loads are, are quite high for nylon as well. Um, really the, the large advantage in synthetic ropes is that they're lightweight technology. So their mean breaking strength to weight ratio when compared to steel is through the roof. And um, ultimately what that means is you, you get a lot more bang for your buck when you're putting things on an anchor handling vessel and need to install these uh, mooring systems. And as I said before, these systems can be tailor made to the project specific needs. Um, the stiffness and MBL of the rope can be changed simply by introducing new sub ropes, or it can be changed by going through different uh, synthetic rope uh, materials. So you can use nylon, polyester, Dyneema, et cetera, and that can give you different performance characteristics as you need. So our specific project began just about two years ago. Um, we started with a synthetic mooring system design and cost uh, exercise where we developed a basis of design for the New York bite area and carried out the design of the synthetic mooring system to 25% feed. And that included looking at different design load conditions that range from the DLC 1.2 cases where we did a full fatigue study all the way up through the 500 year SLC cases. And we also looked at um, the, the reliability cases where you have one mooring line broken and you can see how the platform shifts and what the uh, alternative loads are going to be. Um, we've just completed the 150th, and actually I should scratch that out, so it turned out to be a 170th scale model test, um, our, our wind wave basin. We are continually being constrained by the larger wind turbines, so we did a 170th scale test. That was completed two months ago. We've just done, um, gotten done processing the data and um, are certifying the performance of that model relative to the numerical model that we used to design the system. And like I said before, we're going to be doing a mooring line certification test down in Holloway, Houston and uh, a classification society review using all of those data um, will be done to achieve approval in principle. And we'll be working with NREL to do a levelized cost of energy analysis um, using all of the inputs from the different project partners. And so the project partners you can see here, we actually have a very large project team on this, on, uh, on this specific project. Um, we have a hull design team, which includes um, rope experts like Brian Beckart, um, Bryhoff and Triton have provided us anchor designs for the rope system that we developed. And HOE, um, Atkins, Kent PLC um, has developed a mooring installation plan for our specific mooring system. The testing team includes stress engineering services. Um, Cesar Del Vecchio, who's a, a world leading expert in synthetic rope technology, is helping us write our test specification. And that will be conducted at Holloway Houston, as I mentioned before. And our technical advisory team includes NREL, ABS, and DNV. They'll both be certifying the design. Um, as well as IMDC and input from Kent University. So this is what our mooring system design actually looks like. Um, one of the goals that we wanted to achieve for this specific design was to shrink the mooring radius down as small as we possibly could. So what we ended up with was a 300 meter radius mooring system, the fair lead chains 10 meters long, the synthetic ropes 159 meters long, and the anchor chains 76 meters. 
this is really pushing it about as close to as small as we could go physically for this 15 megawatt floating turbine. We're right up against the limits of the, the maximum offsets that we can have for the platform, as well as we're starting to get very close to those fatigue performance issues that Chris was talking about before. And again, the fatigue was limited to the performance of the chain components themselves. We've classified the system as a redundant three-line system. I know that that's gonna make some people cringe, um, but the mooring system actually survives if you sever one of the lines. The platform shifts a couple hundred meters, and you may lose your dynamic cable, but you're not going to lose station keeping, and the turbine isn't going to go crash into another wind turbine. So ABS has said for a conceptual design that makes sense, but we really have to do a lot of detailed engineering on that cable connection to make sure that we're not going to disrupt the grid at the farm level. Um, we've included a little bit of integrated buoyancy along the line to reduce the need for expensive cans and different hookup locations and to reduce the number of those hookup interfaces which become pl complex from installation standpoint. And as I said before, simple installation method allows for a cheap um, hookup procedure, O&M, and repair if something were to go wrong. So this is a, a kind of complex slide here showing a bunch of different numerical results. Um, one thing in particular that I would like to kind of draw attention to is this top left result here. What we have are different contours of what we call dynamic stiffnesses. So synthetic ropes have viscoelastic properties. And one of the ways that you can model those viscoelastic properties is to do a static simulation and a dynamic simulation because the ropes have different stiffness characteristics when you have dynamics and, and statics. What these different dots are are where all of the little cycles in all of our DLCs that we've simulated lay out across those contours of dynamic stiffness. So what you need to do is when you actually numerically analyze your rope, um, you need to make sure that the rope that you're analyzing in your model actually reflects what you're designing for. So it's an iterative process where say you do a 50 year design condition like DLC 6.1, you figure out what the amplitude of the tension ranges are in that simulation, you go and you choose what your dynamic stiffness of your rope is, and then you iterate back again to make sure that you get the dynamic performance that you need. So this is a relatively expensive and complex procedure, and we're working to try to reduce the number of simulations that you can use here. And one of the things that we found is by using um, a nonlinear lookup curve like um, NREL has helped develop is one way that you can achieve those nonlinear properties. On the top right here, you can see the fatigue performance of the system. The minimum fatigue life we found was in um, one of the lines was a 52-year fatigue life with a target of about 25 years. Um, and as I said before, the fatigue life here is controlled by the performance of the chain, not by the nylon ropes themselves. In the bottom left, you can see kind of statistics of the different DLCs. Um, the, the thick black bar here is the mean breaking strength of the synthetic rope itself. You can see kind of some red dots here in DLC 1.6. What those conditions are, that's the turbine operating and seven and a half meter waves actually going by the turbine. I like to say that we would probably shut the turbine down if a storm that large was coming by and we can, we can generally forecast waves that are in the order of magnitude of seven to eight meters high. So I, you know, that, that's been approved. Um, I think controls for um, wave heights are, aren't there yet for different developers and different floating technologies, but I think it makes sense to start turning these machines off during those really extreme conditions. And then at the bottom right, you can see the different mean tensions and um, the max tensions here from a dynamic standpoint for the anchor designs. Um, and again, we've worked with both Ryhoff and Triton to make sure that we have anchors that have um, sufficient uplift capacity so that they can withstand these semi-taut loads. So this was supposed to be a, a video, and uh, as everyone said, uh, we have a PDF here, so we can't really see it. But this is a schematic of what our basin test looked like. So we, uh, we opted to use a drag disc to get at, at least the mean uh, wind loads appropriate here. And we have a scale, 170th scale model of the 15 megawatt hall. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we have an active mooring system here, at least for the lead line. And that's controlled by an actuator. And that actuator actually gets fed in into the controls on nonlinear lookup curve where the position of the platform and the tension in the line get read into that lookup curve, and the actuator pulls in and out at an appropriate rate to model the stiffness of the real numerical system. So what that enables us to do is to skip that iterative process of the dynamic stiffness lookup curves um, and just generally model the behavior of the rope itself um, in real time. So again, I said before here, we have 170th scale model. And if this video were to work, you would be able to see the actuator paying in and out and as the waves go by, the actuator pulls in a little bit as the tension drops, and then when it pulls out, the tension increases. And what happens is you essentially get a hysteresis behavior here along a normalized load lookup curve. So what that hysteresis is showing you is how the system's absorbing the wave energy, and also how nonlinear of the behavior you have is along that lookup curve. 
As I said before, the full um, and yarn scale rope testing will be conducted in fall of 2022. So those ropes have just been delivered to Holloway Houston. What that will do is will give um, confidence in what the rope performance is, both from an ultimate load standpoint, as well as fatigue load standpoint. So those of you who are familiar with nylon ropes, there's a concern that at very low tensions, the nylon sub ropes will actually abrade them, uh, against themselves and cause degradation. So what we've done is we've actually taken the loads from our numerical analyses and we're altering our fatigue test matrix so that we capture those minimum loads. We're not just testing at high mean loads. We're actually gonna test at very low loads to see if we encounter any of those degradation mechanisms. Uh, some of the quick outputs we, hear, we have here from the model comparison. Basically what I'd like to go over here is um, we have less than a 5% difference in the surge and heave and pitch natural periods when comparing the numerical model with the basin model. And this includes the nonlinear um, active mooring system lookups and a less than 10% difference in the maximum tensions for a SLC case, which is the 500 year hurricane case. Um, this is just a, a, a time history trace here of a linear surge free decay test. And as you can see, the performance of the, the nonlinear active mooring system works uh, quite well with what we were modeling in our numerical model. Um, I'm gonna go very quickly through this. This is the rope test planning uh, procedure, as I said before. Bryden Beckhart has provided full-scale rope samples, and we're gonna be testing a, a lot of these tension-tension cycles at these very low amplitude tension bins here because we think those are the locations that are most important from a fatigue standpoint for the nylon materials. So one thing I'd, I'd like to do is kind of reflect back on, um, we're, we're just over 50% complete with our project here and talk about some of the lessons that we've learned because we've learned a lot working um, with both uh, Brian and Beckert, Cesar at, at Stress Engineering Services, as well as some of the developers and other key stakeholders on our research advisory board. Um, and the first thing that I've I hit on before is that the mooring system design becomes an iterative analysis. And those iterative analyses are very expensive. And if you start mixing in different rope materials into that iteration, um, the design process can actually take quite a long time. Um, and as I'm sure several folks here know and, and understand, we don't wanna do a whole bunch of time history simulations if we can get away with it. So developing these tools where we can um, uh, look at the per performance of the ropes and integrate the nonlinear performance as quickly as possible, I think is a, a key thing to take home here. Um, also putting rope mooring and component testing procedures before scale model tests, uh, I think makes sense. We've organized our, our um, workflow here where we do our model test and then we go to our rope test. But we don't have 100% confidence in what the nylon rope properties are yet because we haven't tested those ropes. So I think putting that before so that we can get the rope properties and then input them into our scale model test would be a more appropriate workflow. Um, one thing that we've learned um, for model scale testing, and I harped on this at the OC meeting uh, yesterday, is that as these floaters and these wind turbines get bigger, the different physics that are happening for aerodynamics, hydrodynamics, and now we're, we're looking at material nonlinearities, all scale at different rates. And as these wind turbines get bigger, the effect of the difference of those scaling ratios starts becoming larger. And when your basin size stay fixed, those, be, those issues become very apparent. Um, so a, a suggested workaround there is to lay out your basin and sensor capabilities at the beginning of the test campaign, know what your limitations are, and use the technology that you have available to work around those limitations. And one thing that we did here was to, uh, to use the active mooring system to gain those nonlinearities in the mooring system um, and be able to model those readily. Um, the controlled mooring system that we developed, um, I think it, ha it shows promise to be used on, on the three different legs. Uh, the downwind legs that we used in this project um, essentially have no stiffness at the location that we were testing them. They're, they're essentially there to keep the yaw position of the, of the floater appropriate. Um, and I think the, the choosing the springs and the ropes that we use to model those leeward lines is very difficult. We're talking about one, one pound per inch stiffness of those springs. You know, you can go like this. It's a rubber band, essentially. Um, and I think that that will be more appropriately controlled by an, an active mooring system. And now we have the, the means and methods to do so. And then finally, for rope tests, um, the nylon ropes at this scale are, are very compliant. We want that compliance because it helps to reduce fatigue loads and dynamic loads. But again, in order to test that, you need a test rig that can actually stretch the rope that far. And those rigs um, are very few and far between at the, excuse me, the mean breaking loads that we care about. So a suggestion there is to specifically embed sensors um, and sub rope tests to help simplify that behavior. If we can understand the behavior of those ropes on a sub rope scale before we do the full scale tests, I think it'll make designing those full scale tests go a little bit smoother. So with that, I'm all done. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.
All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Matt Hall from NREL. Um, I helped lead our, our previous NARDC project um, on shared mooring systems, which wrapped up about a year ago. Um, Chris, I think at that time we were told that, like you, our project was the first to wrap up, so we'll have to uh, compare notes and see who should thank who on that. <laughs> but I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, so that, that project wrapped up a while ago. I'm not talking about it here because we've, we've talked about it before. Um, instead, I'll be talking about a new project that's yet to start. Um, called Standardized Scalable Mooring Solutions Optimized for the U.S. Supply Chain. Because it hasn't started yet, I don't have any nice uh, results to show like the previous presentations. Um, it'll be pretty conceptual, um, but really just kind of elaborating on the words in our title. That's, that's really the, all the concepts right there, so I'll talk through them a little bit here. So this project's really motivated by the, supp to the supply chain challenge we face with mooring systems for gigawatt scale floating wind farms. If we imagine a single one gigawatt farm, 50 megawatt turbines, the math is pretty simple. Uh, likely we'll need at least 200 anchors, may maybe more, at least 200 kilom uh, kilometers of rope and chain, maybe more. Again, this is back of the envelope, so it's, it's very basic, but they're, they're big numbers. And if you think about the supply chain to support that, um, that that's quite a demand. And that's a demand not just in manufacturing, um, but also space to stage them, uh, the installation process for all that, and maintenance. If, if something fails, which of course it will if we've got 60 turbines in the water for 20 years or longer, um, we need to have maintenance in place to re replace things. So that's the, the challenge that's motivating this project. And then on top of that, we know that these lease areas are not going to be perfect flat seabeds with uniform properties like we've been modeling to this point, or at least at NREL we've been modeling to this point. Um, in our mooring models, I should say. Um, not in the stuff that Walt does, of course. They've, they've got the real situation going there. But um, to, to paint a picture of this, um, if we look at a couple examples of lease areas in California, the water depths vary considerably, maybe from just 30% variation in one case to a factor of over two in another case. So if you have such different water depths, um, you can't just use the sa same mooring design for both. Um, so this means that in these lease areas, in these gigawatt scale projects, we're talking mooring designs that adapt throughout the, the space of the array. Um, of course, that's a challenge in itself. Um, but on top of that, we've got likely different soil conditions across that array area too. So different, uh, maybe anchor sizes required, maybe different anchor types in some instances. Um, so if we think that we need a large quantity of mooring components, but also that within even a given project, there's going to be variations in the designs variations in the selection of those components, their sizes, their types, their lengths. Um, this is potentially quite a challenge to the supply chain to deliver this, to maintain this. So the solution we want to, of course, pursue here is, is standardization. Um, if, if something fails in many of the products we're used to today, um, hopefully it's a standard component, a certain size, a certain type. You can go to the shop or the, the warehouse, whatever it might be, and replace it with the same thing. Um, th this, you know, standardization works in all kinds of areas here. Um, and in the case of floating wind, how, how can we make it work there? That's, that's our big question. Of course, like I said, when the conditions vary, the depths vary, um, how can we choose standard components, standard types and sizes of those components so that if we have a warehouse of replacement parts, we have maybe a few different mooring line diameters rather than having 20 different diameters for each different turbine in the array. Um, so these are the things we want to figure out in this project. And this was going to be an animation one, one point at a time here, so I apologize. It's a lot all at once. Um, but there's a, a few examples of, of techniques we want to try to apply in this project and see what works best. So the top one there is standardizing the mooring line material types and sizes. So I think this is maybe the most, most direct one. Can we go down to just one chain diameter or two chain diameters, same with rope diameters, in a whole array, even if the depths vary considerably within that array. Um, similarly with anchors, uh, can we go with one anchor type? Can we go with one anchor size or just a few anchor sizes so that again, if we need to replace something, we've got the parts on hand and we don't have to inventory a, a large amount of replacement parts. Um, some, some more out there concepts would be sharing mooring lines and sharing anchors. So if we share anchors, Nice feature there is we're re reducing the anchor count, but also we're reducing the number of connections with the seabed. And of course, that varying seabed properties and seabed depth is our biggest source of variation in the design. So if we minimize our connection points with the seabed, it gives us more room to standardize. Same with shared mooring lines. 
if we're not even touching the seabed with some of our turbines or with some of our mooring lines at least, that means they might have the same lengths across the array. So these are uh, kind of the, the palette of options we want to look at for standardi standardizing. Some very mainstream, some a little more innovative, and we'll, we'll basically see in this project what, what, proje uh, what techniques work, work best. And secondly, not just what works best for standardizing amid these variations, but what works best for the local supply chain. Because ultimately, it really comes down to what you can produce um, and install. That's really what's going to drive this. So we want to make sure it's optimized for the supply chain capabilities, not just standardized in a kind of hypothetical uh, vacuum. So in terms of our methods and, and what we're really trying to innovate on here, the, the main concept is to combine our mooring design tools, which include some of these more innovative ideas, with our supply chain analysis capabilities. So NREL has another project looking at supply chain for offshore wind. We have ongoing work in this area as well, the kind of the techno-economic modeling. So we want to kind of bring these together with our mooring design capabilities within the design loop and have this kind of iterative approach so we can try different design variation that we think will help standardize, then go look at our supply chain models. How can we actually uh, deliver this mooring design based on the supply chain constraints and iterate there until we've really come up with a design that we think is optimized for the supply chain. I should mention we're focusing on two uh, West Coast sites for this study, so focusing mostly on the supply chain is relevant to the West Coast. And lastly, I'll just kind of, this is our, our project summary slide. So um, NREL is leading this work. Delmar is our main partner, providing expertise in the mooring components and the supply chain as well there, um, and also just what what it takes to have an industrialized, installable mooring system design. And Delmar, of course, includes Vryhoff. Uh, of course, our advisory board is really important, too. We have Equinor on board, uh, California Office of Planning and Research, as well for some more regional uh, site-specific things. And our main project effort is going to combine both the kind of concept I mentioned of this iterative uh, coupled design process, and then also trying to develop a couple uh, optimized designs that are yeah, optimized for the supply chain. So those are our two kind of focuses of the work. And yeah, our innovations here are, are really trying to find this large scale standardization of mooring designs, uh, make sure the supply, supply chain modeling is informing our design process. And the benefits, of course, are not just uh, trying to reduce bottlenecks, um, but also maximizing potentially the local content use in these, in these uh, mooring designs. So our deliverables will be an analysis of the mooring supply chain um, for, for the kind of West Coast conditions in the US and ultimately those industrialized, standardized, scalable designs that we come up with in the project. Um, and aiming to, of course, make all that open source and, and publicly available. Um, so with that, thanks a lot and look forward to any questions. My name is Bill Fan. I work uh, for GE Global Research Center uh, in upstate New York. Um, the project was led by Virginia Tech initially. Um, professor Lei Zhou was the professor in Virginia Tech. Uh, most recently, he moved to University of Michigan. Um, we are the sub uh, GE Global Research to the Virginia Tech. And I have Ahmed working with me in research center. Uh, we also have three graduate student currently working with us from Virginia Tech. Um, uh, Yifan was a visiting student in Virginia Tech when he worked on this project, and now he's in China. Um, we also have a postdoc, uh, Javert, working for us uh, right now for this project. So the, the title of this project is called Dual Functional uh, Tune Inertial Damper. And when we call it dual functional, there's two purposes for this design. One is uh, design enhanced advanced damper for semi-submersible platform. Second one is we were thinking if we can generate additional energy by harvesting the vibration energy. Um, uh, the way we, we, we are doing that is we are connecting the damping system of the dynamic system to a generator, essentially. And you will see uh, some of the details how we're going to do that. Uh, some of the pictures. Uh, this uh, was a three-year project. We are kind of halfway. 
I think the first go no go decision is going to be March uh, next year. Um, and the project will end by December 2024. All right, so, so the main focus of the talk is going to be um, uh, for first of all, uh, offshore platform, uh, semi submersible um, platform. And the reason we are interested in the semi submersible is if you look at the market, uh, most of the developer is looking at the submersible as the most, I wouldn't say most economical, but most easy to handle platform. And the reason is it's, it's relatively easy to manufacture. More importantly, you can assemble the whole turbine onshore, essentially, and you can barge out the system uh, to the sea. Uh, so there's a lot of advantage of looking at submersible. The, the issue of the semi submersible is, as you probably know, it's a very flat and shallow, very large, shallow structure. And this is uh, uh, very much subject to ocean energy, hydro energy, wave, and wind. So there's a lot of vibration issue you have to handle uh, to use this more effectively. Um, so the picture on the, on the very right is the, the Unreal uh, 5 megawatt OC4 platform, essentially. Um, and there are three columns connect to the bottom platform. Each column is about 20 meter long, 10 meter diameter. It's a very large column. And diameter is about 20 to 24 meter uh, of the platform. I'm showing you with uh, two concepts. The top one is what we call TMD concept. So it's a tube mass damper. It's, it's a very common method people use to damp out uh, vibration, for example, in the, in the high buildings. So the idea is you attach a small mass to a very big mass. When the big mass vibrates, if you tune your system, that is, you tune your stiffness and damping the system, you will essentially transfer your vibration energy from big mass to small mass. So you end up with a big mass that is pretty much a standstill. The small mass will vibrate like a crazy. And so that's the, in the ideal situation. Now, you may ask, where does the energy go right, this, in this system? The energy will go, obviously, to the damper. So here, what we are thinking is we can replace the damper with another mass. Um, and, and this is a highlight in this red is if you replace this uh, C, at the damper, with a spring and another small mass M3, C3. Um, and the idea is you can drive um, a system to absorb this energy more effectively than just using a pure damping, um, um, a, 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 vis a viscous damping, for example. Um, so, for example, for each of the columns, we can replace the column, first of all, with a mass here. So this mass will move up and down. And as a tube mass damper, when the, the platform tries to vibrate, this mass will, 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 will move, like I said, crazy uh, quite a bit. What, what we propose to do is connect this mass uh, with the rotating spring system, a gear system, and then connect with a generator. So essentially, when the small mass try to move, it kind of turn the generator. And the more it wants the mass uh, to move, the more uh, resistance it will receive from generator. It, it's like, um, if I put an energy, analog, it's more like an engine brake. Uh, when, the, when the car tried to move really fast, you put a high gear, uh, it will stop. Because the engine is being faster and try to provide resistance. So the, so the hope is by doing that, we can essentially amplify your damping effect, which is important because for the tube mass damper to work effectively, usually you want to put a, uh, about three or three to five percent of the bigger mass. Now, five percent seems like a small number, but if you look at the offshore structure, five percent is a lot of metal uh, you need to put there. So the, the hope is if we can reduce this by half, for example, you know, that will um, create lots of benefit of doing that. So um, some of the analytical examples, you know, you can have the two system 
uh, almost exactly the same mass, but it can reduce the, 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 the vibration by half um, you know, using essentially the same mass. Uh, modeling work, I think uh, the, the, the work uh, essentially has two parts. The first part is analytical and simulation. The second part is a <coughs> wave tank. Uh, we uh, plan to create a 150th scale uh, 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 model and, and test it in the wave tank. So this is the kind of the, the platform where we are modeling. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, yeah, I think the first chart shows um, a model result. The first result is we are, we are looking at the different mass ratio uh, to the system. So we are changing from 3%, 6% to the 15% and see how much uh, magnitude reduce um, by, by adding um, TID into the system. Um, as you can see, um, as more and more mass added, uh, you didn't necessarily gain more benefit. There's a kind of isotope. Um, so currently we are looking at the system about 6% inertial mass added. If you look at the physical mass, it's about 2-3% uh, of the total mass added to damp out the system. Uh, that seemed to be um, optimal. The second chart on the right is showing um, the magnitude the reduction uh, due to a different damping ratio in the system. Uh, we model the system with uh, a, a 12 degree of freedom system. So the, the, this includes uh, the platform, the turbine, um, and it has the wing force uh, simulated. Also there's a hydrodynamic force, hydrostatic force, morning force, um, um, yeah, that's that's the that's the main uh, main force. We are also study different wing wave um, combined attack to the system. So there will be angle beta between the wave and the wing coming to the system. Uh, the right picture shows the difference between so-called uncontrolled, so that you don't put any damper in the system, versus the pure TMD. There's just a little damper with a viscous damper, uh, a little mass with a viscous damper. And then uh, they call TIMD is the tune inertial damper combined with the tune, uh, uh, tune mass damper. Um, and you will see the difference uh, of, of three different uh, systems. In general, uh, for the study we did, uh, we conclude uh, the TID uh, compared to TMD has about 15 to 70 percent of benefit um, uh, with essentially the same mass uh, to the system. And um, you know the the six percent mass ratio of the TID is almost equivalent to nine nine percent mass ratio TMD. So you're getting about 50 percent efficiency uh, in damping of the system. Uh, we look at uh, three different cases. Um, uh, the first two cases we look at it was with a different wing speed, uh, six meter, twelve meter, and this is the one the example. We we assume the wave height is three meter. We also look at the second system that is no wing speed. Essentially, the turbine is parked or feathered. Uh, the, the the blade is pitched to feather position, and uh, the wave is a six meter. Per minute, so it's a more like a storm case. You you park your turbine. Uh, so we look at a couple of different cases and try to find the optimal solution or parameter for each of the TMD uh, with the different uh, low case. Yeah, in the in the first case when uh, the wind speed is high, uh, twelve meter per second, and the wave is relatively low we find the, the system is dominated by the wing input. Uh, so what that means, if you change the wave to wing angle, you don't see much difference. Um, and that's simply because uh, <coughs> the wing, wing energy dominates the system. 
Uh, all right. So the the second part of the work is design a subscale um, based on Unreal Five Megawatt OC4 uh, submersible <coughs> uh, model. Uh, there's four columns as shown in the in some of the previous presentations. Uh, so the the tower is sitting in the middle column, and the 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 two mass damper system is sitting on the three big columns. Um, and yeah, it is scaled down to about 250 pounds, uh, 150 is scale. Uh, what you see is the the system we put in is in this in this case it's swimming pool. And I think that I have a picture. They, they, um, Virginia Tech actually um, put this system in one of the wave tank in Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey, um, and and they just started. Uh, they start to put together the TMD, uh, the generator system. Um, one of the challenges is the the wave uh, frequency is relatively low, so to damp out that system, you need a very extremely soft spring. Um, it is uh, quite a challenge, especially for a scaled version, because the, the spring is is almost it literally like a low rubber band. <laughs> in that case, it's it's actually hard to find a spring uh, have a, such a low stiffness. Uh, here are some details uh, for different subsystem, um, because the 150 scale actually pose challenging. How to, for, for example, how do you make a blade? was extremely lightweight. Uh, so some of the blade was made uh, with the fab, uh, fabric wrap around um, a structure uh, as, as a low weight solution uh, for the system. Um, the, the TID was controlled by pulley. So when the spring, uh, the small mass tried to move up and down, it drive a pulley system. And the pulley system drive a generator, essentially on the top. So that's how the system will get connected. Um, some of the details, how we uh, made the TID system. Um, I think with the interest of time, I will just skip over. Um, so, so the, the pulley system I talk about and the, the soft spring you see on the picture on the, on the right. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges is uh, uh, in, in the surface, uh, surface system, the, the spring is so soft, the mass kind of tilted, shifted as it vibrates. So it creates friction um, on, on, on the column wall itself. So you have to be pretty careful when you assemble the whole system. Uh, some of the wave te tank test, uh, again, they run it. Um, <coughs> it it's a movie, but uh, I cannot show here. Okay. All right, that's awesome. all I have. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Another round of applause for all of our presenters. Just as a thank you. And now I'll open up the, the Slido app I hope you've all been using. Um, and if not, you can kind of the Slido code. Um, we have about 30 minutes, so I think we can. Oh. <laughs> we have a lot of questions. <laughs> so I'll try to make sure I, I evenly distribute them. Um, and I think on the Slido app, you can rank the questions or upvote them so we can get to the higher ones. Uh, so for PPI, the, el the elongation curve is given for compression, uh, but this doesn't seem to happen, this doesn't happen in mooring. Uh, what is what is the tension curve? Yeah, I can clarify this. So um, the, the mooring system is in tension, but the polymer component is actually in compression. So as the pad eyes of those two components get further away, it actually compresses the polymer system. Uh, for UMAIN, the synthetic rope is 
<coughs> the synthetic rope is not allowed to touch the seabed. How do you avoid sea bottom touching issues for the taunt mooring configuration? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So that was one of the benefits of using integrated buoyancy is um, during installation, you can allow um, a wet storage of the synthetic rope um, because it's positively buoyant, so it won't touch down. And in the really high offset cases, you, you essentially have two options. Um, with a typical synthetic rope without buoyancy, um, you design the pretension such that it doesn't drop to a point where the synthetic rope touches the ground, um, or you can add buoyancy in that. Essentially, just inherently prevents it. Thank you. Um, from Matt at Inrail, uh, which mooring, which mooring or anchor standardization methods are looking most promising so far? <laughs> we haven't started yet, so <laughs> I will <laughs> take the safe approach and not answer that question. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, then a question for all of you, actually. The, as most of the pan panelists are academic or research labs, how do you expect the technologies to transition uh, to industry implementation? Uh, we are not really a research, we are industrial research center. So I think, uh, yeah, we are looking at uh, <laughs> <laughs> some difference. Uh, I, th I think uh, we are very much application oriented. I think we are looking at the uh, tech to market study after, the, after phase one. The phase two is gonna be heavily involved in uh, study the LCOE, um, study um, the potential of you know, apply this technology in the, in the NTI, into the GE NTI process, um, possibility of doing that. So, uh, yeah, that, that will be one of the subject of the study. Next. Thank you. Any other? Well, um, ours was only a feasibility study, but we still used, um, uh, used the kind of the, the strategy we use with joint industry projects. Um, and so the funders and the industry were involved in planning the entire project. So the results were kind of oriented towards feasibility and demonstration of that in a practical setting. So. For our, our moorings work so far, I think we've taken a pretty open approach. So we like it if our work and analysis can inform industry decision making <coughs> and you know, spur innovations that way. When we have industry partners on our projects, also you know they have a more a greater opportunity to go forward with that technology. And of course, when we're helping industry partners like Principal Power, um, certainly that's a way our, our work can just go towards whatever they're pursuing. I would say the the ABS approval and principal process. It's not a rubber stamp to to use your design everywhere, but it says that you've done due diligence and that this makes sense from a commercial standpoint. And as I said before, the um, research advisory board, the fact that there are developers and people really interested in commercializing the technology has helped our project. Um, you know, it helps steer it to be more realistic. Thank you. And, and from the industry side, I mean, we partner, we've partnered with Matt, we've partnered with uh, UMass on different projects. Um, typically, we're using that for ideas that aren't necessarily ready for a commercial project yet, um, but, but we're involved in paying attention and use that to develop novel ideas that might be used in future deployments. For PPI, have you investigated uh, the fatigue performance of the sea spring? Yeah, it's 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 a pretty interesting um, polymer. So it's been designed by DuPont for other applications. So the actual polymer component has very, very good fatigue performance. So the fatigue performance of the component is actually driven by the metalwork. And so they're designing the metalwork of that system to meet certain fatigue targets. And so it's then kind of becomes a parallel with the, the, the rest of the mooring system, which is also driven by the metal fatigue of that. Okay. Uh, and then another question for you, Maine. Uh, the mooring system has material nonlinearity and geometric nonlinearity. Are both correctly modeled in your active mooring system for the model test? Yeah, so that's part of the iterative process that we go through is, you know, we make a, a numerical model of the full system and we can input the material nonlinearities as a lookup table within Mordine. Um, you run an offset simulation and a dynamic simulation and then you can back calculate what the, you know, the contribution of both nonlinearities kind of built into one. So it, it takes that into consideration and the active mooring system in the basin test takes that output as a direct input for, for the lookup curves. And then 
There's a question on uh, why is there? Why did you focus on shallow water mooring application uh, when floating wind in the U.S. Uh, to date is mostly planned on deep waters, very deep waters. So we actually have two projects in NOWRDC. Um, one of them is focused on deep water applications looking on the west coast. Um, but for the shallow water project with the TFI Sea Spring, we saw the most, it likely to have the most bang for the buck in a shallow water situation where you don't have as many design options on the table as you do in a deeper water system. And so we chose to target that shallow water segment and, and really stress test what we could do with this component and how much difference we could see there. But if you're interested in our deep water program, <laughs> find Bruce after, afterwards and ask him questions. <laughs> Why do people design jackets and monopiles for deeper water? <laughs> Shouldn't they stay in shallow water? I mean, it's, you know, we want to find where the cutoff of feasibility is for all technologies, right? And we want to know what the costs of those are so that we can say, yeah, a floating mooring system for 50 meters of water depth doesn't make sense compared to a monopile or jacket. But maybe at 60 meters of water, we're starting to look competitive. So we got to find the thresholds, right, if, if we're going to develop in these areas. Can add something to that. Oh, yeah. Chris. Um, the the deep water applications are mainly in the west coast. On the east coast, if you look at um, the the fixed foundation developments, and if you look beyond that, there are lots of sites which actually go into this transitional water depth. So I think it was you, Monica, who were talking about how much of uh, new developments are likely to happen with floating technology. So there is a transition range where floating technology would be applicable, but the water depth is considered shallow from our uh, offshore in industry understanding of deep versus shallow. So that's, that's the driver for some of our research. Thank you. Uh, and then we have a question for the, the TMD sy system. Uh, the number of elements added to the platform can complicate the design, inspection, and maintenance. Uh, do you think, I, I know you mentioned it's, you're gonna have a second phase, but is it your gut feel that the benefits uh, of your design outweigh the drawbacks? I think so. I think that the, the benefit we are looking at about 40% reduction in the, in the dynamic uh, response, and hopefully get about five to 10% additional electricity uh, by adding a generator. Now, that's a legitimate concern. You have so many moving uh, small components inside this cylinder. Um, but in general, it's a pretty simple system. When I say simple, because um, you're having a moving mass uh, running by a gear, and then just uh, rotate uh, a generator. Uh, <coughs> those components, much of that has been industrialized for, for many, many years, so we believe Yes, there's a moving component, but those are pretty standard moving components. Hopefully, it's, it's not too bad um, a system, you know, if you look at the cost uh, versus risk. Thank you. When, can I, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. When do you plan on going to kind of your phase two? I know you said you're about 50% done with phase one, but your phase two is going to be I think phase two costs. is uh, hopefully by end of next year, uh, 2023 or beginning of 2024, we're going to have um, a four scale kind of testing, uh, one fiftieth scale testing wave with the wing and the wave uh, both. And then we're going to demonstrate the benefit uh, of, of all the system. Okay, and considering the cost benefit yes. analysis. Okay. Yes. Uh, and also the, the, the tech to market study is, is mainly a cost study and how feasible we can integrate in the existing product line. Okay. Uh, Great. Thank you. Um, we have a question on, in oil and gas, fatigue and corrosion are leading causes of failures. On an individual line level and a wind farm level, what failures problems keep you up at night? No, everybody, it's for everyone. What, it, what is your mooring nightmares or your, your innovation? <laughs> what, what scares you? Uh, connections. Okay. Uh, both steel connections which, which suffer from fatigue, um, the material properties instead of getting better seem to be degrading in terms of quality of steel and manufacture and suffer from installation essentially mistakes that can degrade the performance as well as the right now connections for the, the ropes they're hand spliced 
Um, so there's a supply chain bottleneck there. If we're going to be talking about hundreds of kilometers of synthetic ropes, someone has to actually make those connections by hand for every single rope, for twice every rope, because you have to do both ends. So yeah, I think if we can industrialize that and um, make that a more streamlined process, that's going to be a, a huge gain. Does anybody else want to share their nightmares? Um, it, it's, I won't call it a nightmare. It's an interesting challenge. Uh, looking at uh, viscoelastic behavior of these synthetic lines, I think it was various talks I mentioned that, and uh, it's basically now modeled as lookup tables and uh, curve fits and whatnot. But our own research has shown viscoelastic behavior also causes time delays. And that could mess up the overall response of the platform and how the interplay between the mooring line and the platform is. So that's an interesting challenge I would like to tackle. I'll just add that uh, we're very interested in some upcoming work to try to analyze that question better. What are the biggest nightmares at an array level? <laughs> I, I think for us, uh, we, we choose the semi versus the TLP. Uh, we look at the TLP in the beginning, and then, then we think of the semi is easier <laughs> in terms of morning design, you know, compared to TLP. And you hope you made the right decision? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, TLP, you know, you're talking about 10 times yeah. tension yeah. compared to uh, sure. Uh, I have a, another question for everyone. Uh, what technology would benefit your research to be researched in parallel with you? Or you know, if you could dream a research to, to be done in parallel to help you advance, what would it be? Large offset dynamic cables. Oh, yeah. The more compliant you can make the mooring system, the cheaper it's going to be. But you got to drag that cable along with you. Um, and Maybe you don't need a cable. Maybe you're generating hydrogen right on the floater. Um, maybe that's how you get rid of the cable problem. Um, but you know, unlike oil and gas, we don't have a rigid riser going up to our platform. Um, so the wind turbine doesn't care that much that it's moving. It, it sees the effect because you have a pitch motion. But I want to let that thing move around a little bit and, and take advantage of the compliance of the moorings. Bradley, anything? Uh, for me, it's, it's the platform itself. Uh, as you can see, the semi submersible platform is huge. I mean, literally huge. We are talking about 20,000 tons, you know, with, with the, the blast weight um, added. Um, how do you make it smaller? Um, I saw some of the presentation already, you know, with, you know, with, with, with some uh, nice concept. But in general, I think uh, we like the platform. It's just too big and too heavy in general. I thought Spencer's answer was fantastic. The <laughs> dynamic cables, that's, yeah, that I think that's right on. <laughs> I think as, as more of a technology provider and less doing basic research, uh, we're excited to see lots of different projects going on with different ideas. I think I saw one of the other questions relating to um, like the trade-offs between a synthetic system and the TFI C spring. It'd be really interesting to compare notes when we're mm -hmm. both done. And which I mean, we're interested in developing the most cost effective mooring system for what's out there that's like at a TRL that's ready. And if it's a different system, then we're happy to offer that. Mm -hmm. So we're excited to see different options being explored and seeing kind of what falls out as potential winners. Chris, anything? Yeah, I uh, I'm trying to think, uh, couldn't single out any one particular thing. I've always been very um, interested in uh, all the mature technology from oil and gas migrating into, into, the, into the emerging industries. So I would like to see more of kind of qualifying many of those technologies, which is already well developed uh, in the oil and gas industry to be kind of streamlined and, and available for the renewable energy. That's what I would think would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, so we have one for Spencer and Krish. Uh, can you offer commentary on the surge stiffness of the platform for a conventional catenary chain mooring system and your novel systems? Our, our surge stiffness was 
um, comparable. Uh, the material stiffness is a little bit lower, but because we shortened the system and increased the pretension, it stayed about the same. I think, I think the surge period maybe dropped by something like 10 or 15 percent, which I consider pretty comparable between the two Simpson systems. We're pretty far outside the wave range for the surge period anyway. So. Yeah, I think the, um, I can't recall what the surge period differences were, but um, if I were to construct the scenario mentally, um, the synthetic line system by its very nature is going to be a bit more, provide more horizontal elastic, like a restoring effect. So that, that would change the natural period correspondingly. So make it softer. Um, and then this is a question for principal power. Is DLC make it tighter. Is DLC six point two idle with the yaw error not considered design driving for mooring systems? Or is the backup power system for the turbine a requisite? For this project we assumed we had a backup power system for the turbine. Um, so not looking at DLC six two. If DLC six one is controlling without that, and then you add in not having a backup yaw system, DLC 62 is typically going to be more severe for the morning system. I'd like to add a little bit on that. In, say, IEC design guides, the tower gets a different safety factor between the two <laughs> DLCs. The mooring system, right now, as the, co the codes are written, doesn't get to benefit from that change in safety factor. I think that's, you know, some research should be done on that in terms of what the inherent reliabilities between those two conditions are. And, maybe make it a little bit tighter for the, the safety factors. Thank you. Uh, and then a question again for, for you, Ming. Can the fair lead be located on top of the column to simplify the access? Yeah, the I think for the Volturnus hull and other hull technologies where the fair lead is placed is um, kind of a constructability issue as well as an O&M issue. Um, as modeled, the fair lead connections below the water. Um, uh, Houston Atkins, who does did the installation procedure actually developed a concept where you place it on top of the column and then have a winch there to help in some of the installation procedures. Um, I think ultimately it comes up to you know what's most efficient from an installation standpoint, what machinery is available, and how you're going to do all of the, the tension processes. They had a follow-up question. What does uh, what rope were you considering? What synthetic rope were you included in your project? Was it nylon, polyester, or dynamic? It was a 219 millimeter uh, nylon rope. Thank you. Um, and here's one. I'm not sure, but anyways, I'll I'll ask it and let me know what you think. Um, how can rope suppliers reduce CO2 footprint of manufacturing? Developers are on a path to net zero to include scope-free emissions, which it affects supply chain. So I don't know if you've taken a look into that, but I know it's a kind of a can of worms <laughs> that needs to get open, but it's a I'm going to opt out and say I would contact the rope manufacturers. They're by far the experts. Um, there is some recycled content. I don't know how much energy it takes per kilogram of rope, but I'm, I would imagine it's on par, if not less than kilogram of steel for chain. Um, yeah, reach out to the rope manufacturers. They, they're looking into this, um, especially in the European market where these requirements are popping up. Uh, and then one new question has come up. What are, what are the typical offset limits you consider for dynamic power cables? We use 30% of the water depth, so just over 20 meters for our project. Yeah, I think that's a pretty common assumption, 30% of water depth. We've used less in deep water, a smaller ratio, but I guess it, it's kind of, you know, you take a look at your water depth and you ask people to give you a good guess, at least at this point. I can't recall, uh, Banjoon, do you recall how much uh, offset we did? Ten? Uh, you put your head down. Right? So that's why, uh, <laughs> was it, uh, did we assume 10%? 15? Yeah, start with 15, but you know, yeah, the we allowed it to go a bit I mean, more. we allowed to to 35% yeah. because yeah. if you increase the length and then save more in, you know, design, that, you know, it's more economic than, yeah. you know, you, you can increase you know, right. one dynamic cable length, right? With a lady shape. And then we use number of mooring system or number of line, right? Right. And you, you will save installation, right? Everything. So, yeah. 
Yeah, so around 30, 35 percent max yeah. is what we looked at. Okay, cool. I think, I think I got everything in Slido. So thank you for all your answers and your time and presentations. Thank you for moderating, Jerrica, and thank you all for uh, the, the time you spent here with us for the last two days, and, and, and those of you virtually, you as well. Um, now, us in person get a bit of a reward for making the trip here. We're, we're off to the Alumni Center, which uh, uh, Andy explained the directions to earlier, but it's sort of in that direction. Yeah, I can leave, folks. I'll be leaving in like two there minutes. Meet me so, at the elevator. So, great. Hello. Thank you. Yeah, Andy. Yeah.